three higher ed authors, 100 plus college and university presidents, dozens of actionable insights for academic leaders. Commencement, the beginning of a new era in higher education is now available on Amazon. Welcome back, everybody. It's your time to add up on the Edup Experience podcast, where we make education your business. Dr. Joe Salustio, back with you again here as we move on and continue to have some of the most fascinating, innovative, and important conversations in and around higher education today here on the Edup Experience podcast. We will never stop doing what we do to bring you these important leaders, changing the lives of students of all ages. And we've got another amazing guest for you today. Uh, of course, and you know I've said it probably for the last 50 to 100 episodes, if you haven't yet picked up uh, the book that I wrote with Kate Colbert called Commencement, The Beginning of a New Era in Higher Education, which we, of course, took the first 125 presidents we interviewed on this podcast and took every great thing they had to say and put it in a book. You can get it on Amazon. You can give us a review, which would be much appreciated. But there is no better $32 professional development, we believe, um, than that book where you can get insights from all those amazing people. And, uh, you know, there's probably going to be a book two and a book three. As we can, How could we stop? There's just too many people to, to bring on and too many people to quote. And uh, one person that's going to help me with this amazing conversation today is my guest co-host. He's back now. I think this is the second time. Here he is, ladies and gentlemen. He is the one and only Elliot Malkowitz, editor-in-chief and head of content for Fierce Education. Elliot, what's going on? Well, thank you, Joe, and you pronounced my name perfectly as if you grew up where I did. If I, if I grew up in New York, I would say Malkowitz. If you grew up anywhere else, you'd say Markowitz. So, Correct. but you know, I say it like you do, though, because I want to get it right, Elliot. And there's only only one you, right? When That's somebody true. says Malkowitz, you know it's Elliot from Fierce Absolutely. Education. Elliot, I'm excited to have you back. You glad to be back? Oh, absolutely. It's always a pleasure to work with you and to interact with your really insightful guests. Well, what th I couldn't have paid you for a better transition than that, Elliot. Here we go. Ladies and gentlemen, our guest today, he is Ken Smith. He is founder and CEO of Jobs for America's Graduates. Ken, how are you? I am well, and it's a pleasure to be here. It's a pleasure to have you here, my friend. And I, I got to tell you, I love your background, the red, white, and blue ribbon and, and what you do. Uh, amazing. I was sifting through your website and reading up more on Jobs for America's graduates. I feel like I have a really good grasp on what you do, but I want to hear you tell uh, us what you do. Tell our audience, if we hadn't heard of your organization, Jobs for America's graduates, what is it that you do and how do you do it? Well, I appreciate the opportunity. Uh, the good news is this, what we're going to talk about reflects 42 years of experience with almost 1.8 million of the nation's more challenged youth and young adults. Today, we're in 39 states in 1,500 locations, serving about 78,000 of those challenged youth and young adults. We're all about jobs. That's our first name. And so we are focused on preparing young people or young adults for jobs. There's 37 employability competencies that our 19,000 employers, I'll repeat that, 19,000 employers that regularly hire our young people because they show up for work on time, they're customer service focused, they're ready to work and they're ready to learn. That's their words, not mine. So those competencies are what we work using project-based learning as a methodology for learning. We do that primarily in the high schools, but we have 160 middle schools. So we're working in capturing career interests and, and using that to help encourage full-time participation in school. And of course, help them overcome at all levels, the issues outside of the school that get in the way of completion as well as all of the in-school needs for remediation as they may arise. Importantly, we, we follow up graduates for a full 12 months. We wanna make sure they really are successful at work in post-secondary education, in the military, and in life. And that is one of the crucial ingredients, I believe, in the kind of success we've been able to achieve over that 42 years of experience. So we're all about jobs, um, we're all about making sure young people are ready to be adults, be effective in the workforce, have a clear vision of a career that they like to pursue. And, and because I know you're focused on higher education, 
it may be useful to note we actually have young people today in 3,000 different public and private higher education institutions uh, in this country. Amazing. One, one of the great points about this is the rest of the country, as you well know, are down for the third year in the roll of enrollments. Ours went up from 40% to 46% enrollment at the end of the 12 months. We think that's something approaching twice the rate for the population we serve. So we really value post-secondary education to be sure they get the credentials, the skills, the certification, and the degrees that are going to make uh, their life a lot better with better jobs. So that's a lot in a hurry, but I appreciate the chance to say it. It's a lot in a hurry, but it's, boy, is this important work that you're doing. I, um, boy, I, I, I got to say, I got to go back to those, th I think I have it right, 37 competencies. 37? Correct. These are, are these workplace competencies that employers have said, all right, Ken, look, if we're going to bring on these people and hire them, here's a list of things that we need people, people, students or future workforce to have. And if we, if they don't have these things, we probably can't hire them. If that's true, what are some of the most important ones? Maybe the ones that are restated and stated and restated right now, because I'm sure yep. there's a couple that kind of rear above the rest. What are employers looking for? You know, it sounds awfully simple to say, show up for work on time. Yeah. I can't tell you how important that is to employers. And we drill that. Uh, if you're on time, you're late. And if you're early, you're on time, right, Ken? And you've got to be able to communicate. You've got to be able to look people in the eye. You've got to be customer service focused, whether you do it virtually or in person. And, you know, you really need to be ready to learn. I don't care how well prepared you think you are, whatever that specific job is there's almost always more to learn about that particular job. So you need to be ready to learn. And then, you know, life keeps changing on the hour. So you better be ready to keep learning and keep, keep gaining new skills. I would say communications is the other big thing. You gotta be able to talk. You gotta be able to write. You gotta be able to communicate um, <sighs> both internally uh, and, and to the outside world. Um, you need an attitude, you need a positive attitude. You got to arrive enthusiastic. I quoted some of our employers, you know, they show up for work, they're ready to work. They're, and I, I, I know that our employers would tell you why they really are all over us. To give them a chance to talk to our young people is because they have mastered those 37 competencies and they show it, they show it. In fact, We've encouraged, and a couple of companies like Archer Daniel Midland have agreed to this. The algorithms that company use to select people tend to screen our young people out because they don't have any experience. So the, the, the HR people never see them. It never gets through the algorithm. So Archer Daniels Midland, having seen them, said, we'll guarantee a job interview in person or virtual directly with anybody from JAG, not a job, but we're gonna guarantee them an interview because we know we're missing something here by relying too heavily on the algorithms. Epic. You know that the world of higher education is experiencing evolutions and revolutions. You wanna be part of the progress. Commencement, the beginning of a new era in higher education with insights from more than 100 college and university presidents, We'll show you how. Get your copy of Commencement, the Beginning of a New Era in Higher Education now on Amazon right away. We think you're going to love it. It's amazing. Isn't that, uh, it's kind of like, a, well, what is it, an oxymoron a little bit, right? Jumbo shrimp, where you have a system that helps you filter out people that have the competencies that the employers have asked for. Isn't that something? I mean, and, and I'm sure within those 37 competencies, and I'm going to ask you uh, how it got to 37, because that seems like a really weird number um, that that probably in there is technology um, or changing technology and um, how a, a HRIS system can sometimes weed out people who are coming yep. with the exact thing that you need. But how do you get to 37? And is this evolving number? Is it decline or increase? 
does it fluctuate? I mean, AI just hit, you right. know, did it go from 36 to 37? Can you talk about how that number 37 came to be? Sure. There's actually a total, if you start with us in middle school and you stay with us through all of high school, it's actually 88 different competencies. You know, the way we come at this, we will take some of these competencies like communication, but underneath it is using technology to communicate. Underneath it is the ability, you know, to do in an electronic setting like an email versus, you know, so there's a lot to the word communications and the means by which you communicate. So, you know, we really were, we got to where we are because employers consistently, you made the point, Joe, early on, over and over and over again, show up for work on time, be able to communicate, be customer service focused, be ready to work, be ready to learn. We're good. Now, it's great if they've got a credential and a skill. That's terrific. And we're working very hard to do that before they graduate. We're expanding our dual enrollment so they get a running head start on post-secondary education. Um, but it is, it is. I mean, I won't cite the company's name, but I've had you know, somebody in the COO role of a Fortune 500 company turn the camera and show them actually getting on the knees and say, can you give me a chance to reach oh. these young people? Just let me tell my story. So, you know, we've happily built a reputation that if you want good, willing, show up for work on time, ready to work people, you've come to the right place. Um, Elliot, I'll, I'll kick it to you, but I, you've said it three or four times that I've counted, Ken, show up for work on time. What good advice for all of us? Because it, how many distractions we have in life now, especially with our phones and so on, that keep us engaged in something else. Um, I don't care what level you are, uh, for whatever reason, people still don't show up on time. And in, if you're trying to lead a company or you're trying to lead a business, it is the most annoying and lack of professional behavior that that we can have as, as professionals to go, oh, I'm just late. I'm late again. Sorry. I'm late again. Sorry. It's disrespectful almost. Um, so it's funny to hear you say that so many times because that you're repeating what the employers are saying. Precisely. And it, I have to say, I think maybe no surprise after COVID, but it's worse than it was before showing up for work on time. Are you serious? Yep. Yeah, that, that, that's what's really interesting. I mean, what's the old adage? You know, 90% 90, 90 of a job is actually showing up, right? Right. And the right. rest of it is the work and you'll hmm. learn and the communication skills. So I think you hit the nail on the head. You know, I'm curious to get your perspective because what we see here at Fierce Education are, you know, uh, the, the admissions offices and from faculty that the students coming in to higher education, uh, there's there's like an emotional gap. There's a work ethic gap. There's some, I don't want to call it such a learning gap because there has been some, you know, obviously, you know, literacy and some math issues going on, but there's a social gap and a willingness gap. Uh, what's been your experience with today's students over the past couple of years and how have you gotten around that? I think we are seeing the same thing. Um, and I, I get asked this a lot. And it, it, there's no one answer to it. It is for sure taking in some cases in this country two years of socialization out of the equation that they just simply did not have the chance to interact in person with their age group in school. The price we have been and will pay for that, I mean, there may well have been good and sound grounds that the, the, the threat of illness and, and terrible healthcare damage justified it. But the, the effect is that you've got two years of physical maturity, but they've missed two years of socialization and social skills. I think we've seen the numbers ranging from five to 10 times the number of fights that are going on in the schools. It is a dramatic, dramatic increase. It is the, the disengagement, students showing up for an hour or two, not showing up at all, the absentee rates are through the roof. Um, mm -hmm. Yikes! Back, back to showing up on time. The, uh, the mental health issues, I've been at this for 44 years, right? Before there were child labor laws is my story, but it's a long time. I don't think I've ever seen it as challenging an environment that we're in. It is that combination of disengagement, learning loss, which will, I don't know how they'll ever catch up with it, is the mental health issues that are deep and broad. 
um, that are really scary. And you've seen the CDC data, 57% of all teenage girls feel a great sense of despair and the overwhelming words, I don't, I don't feel like I belong. Right. And or at sea, 45% of all the kids in the country are so depressed or despondent or disengaged, they can't even do daily tasks, get up. Get, and, and, get, and, and it really is a, a chain effect because when they have the mental health issues, they lack the motivation or the enthusiasm. And that's where they're showing up and just, you know, I, I have two boys, they're both in college at this point. My, my oldest is actually out of college and married, my oldest daughter. But one of the things I just drill into them, even if it's a part-time job, you show up and you show up on time. Even when you don't feel like it, you still show yep. up because there's a lot yeah, of things in life you're not going to feel like doing, but showing right. up, like I said, is 90% of the job. You know, switching gears just a little bit, I kind of wanted to ask you about, you know, not everybody is also cut out for college, right? I mean, we have a tremendous shortage in certain trades in the country, yep. you know, from, yep. from welders to electricians to pump to plumbers, uh, not, not only in, in corporate, corporate America. Uh, but one of the things I try to encourage is when you're going into a trade, because if you're in a civic organization uh, or even some private ones, unless you at least have some credits and some higher education experience, you can't get promoted or you can't move up the ladder. So, so how do you talk to students who are looking to go into certain trades or certain professions uh, and, and are ruling college out, but you know that that college can only help them further down their career to a degree? So we make a big case that if you really want to have a good life, get a skill. Yes, you've graduated from high school. You know, 96% of all those in JAG graduate from high school. These are the ones the schools have said aren't going to make it. They're wrong. They're wrong. They absolutely can make it. They're filled with promise, but they got sidelined. They got issues at home. They've got what, you know, whatever the issues are. And we have proven the ability that with the right kind of help and support, they're going to do really well. So, but we tell them, good news, you've graduated. Well done. That's, that's the opening gambit uh, of getting a good job. You need a skill. Welder, electrician, plumber. I read the other day that Harvard is claiming great credit that within six years after you graduate, on average, you're making $120,000 a year. And that's one of the highest in the country, right? I'm going graduate from welding school, and I'll show you at Boeing that you, you can make that two years. <laughs> exactly. So, to, I'm just reinforcing your point, Elliot, that uh, that not everybody, and even though you know there's still a bias in this country uh, in favor of going to college. I mean, it's just you know, but the facts, the facts do not support that. Uh, yes, you should get post-secondary education. Yes, you should get the skills. Of the and if you can get a degree, great. But actually, I think the American people and the young people have figured that out, which is why enrollments are down three years in a row. Mm -hmm. Even with the recovery, they're down another 10%. They don't, they don't think the, the value proposition is there. It may be unfair in some cases, but you know, you look at student debt, you know all the issues. So um, I think the, our role in this is to help young people understand, here's what it takes to get a really good job in the career you've got an interest in. Some cases, it's a degree. A lot of cases, it's a certification, it's a license, it's a credential. Let me ask you one more question. I'll throw it back to uh, you know, the man of the hour, Joe. Uh, do you feel that you know, those who are you know, going to college uh, or, or the underserved population, I should say, uh, it's been exasperated through COVID. And because of that, you know, they're going into more skill-based fields than looking at the, you know, business dynamic or the value or lack of value of a secondary education uh, that the experience over the last couple of years really exasperated and brought some of that to light. I think absolutely. Yeah. Uh you know, they pose the question. So I'm going to make more money if I get a four-year degree. Tell me which one of those and what it's going to cost me to get from here to there. Because on average, it takes you six years to get the four-year degree, right? So, you know, make the case. And there's not a good case in 80%. Of, now, if you want to be a teacher, you want to be a social worker, yeah, you're not going to make as much money. But if that's what you want to do, 
at least at the moment, the rules of the game are you got to get the four-year degree. Uh, okay, that's the rules of the game. If you want to do that, great, let's help you do it. But if you really do have a career that falls into the categories where the right credential gets you where you need to go, and then maybe there's a way to get you a credential or two, like I'll make this up, coding. Um, great, go get that right. so you're good money while you're working your way uh, through the post-secondary system. So it's, well, it's interesting, even, even in New York, uh, if you want to go into the New York Police Department, you used to be able to go in out of high school. Now you need at least 60 college credits to even apply into the yeah. NYPD. So some sort of, you know, uh, uh, college experience. And it's usually we're seeing what we're seeing at Fierce Education is a real big influx into the community colleges. Yes. And yet the data shows they've taken the biggest hit in enrollment. So it's good news, but nonetheless, they really, and this, I have to tell you, surprises me because when I was in the, that arena and when I was the advisor to a governor in education, the community college was the place to go. That was the place to go because yeah. in two years you could get a better job. Clearly not viewed as the case today. So it's good news um, that there's those enrollments are coming back because there's such a, a great equalizer, uh, the community colleges. Ken, I wanna take a step back to come forward uh, a little bit and go back to the 12 months that you stay, I thought you said 12 months that you stay in touch with the student after they've gotten yes. a job. Is that correct? Yep. Correct. Why is that important? What, why do you do that, first of all? What is the impact on the student, on the organization? And you know, how do you, it's obviously important, why? So when we designed the JAG model 40 odd years ago, we had a group, we had a business group, a education group, workforce community group, government group. And in the end, the business community won the day and said, look, too often in the K-12 system, if they graduate them, they go, hey, terrific, mission accomplished, we're done. And the business community said, not true, you're not done until you can prove they really can be competent and effective in the workplace. The second message we got is just because they've been placed for 30 days in a job doesn't mean they're connected to the workforce. And the government programs at the time when we launched JAG had a 30 day requirement. If you've worked for 30 days, mission accomplished. And again, the business community said, not true. It takes several months of work and work experience to really get attached to the labor force and to the job. Our experience also says in higher education, Elliot, you know this really well, and Joe, you know, whatever it is, 60, 70% of anybody who's going to drop out of college drops out in the first year. Yeah. That's the big barrier. So one of the reasons we take that 12 months for those 46% of our young people in post-secondary education is to get them through that all important first year. You got to College is a mystery to way too many people. Their parents haven't gone before. They don't know. They're often not, people aren't holding their hand a little bit in the process of getting through it. So a second reason for that 12 months is to be sure that they really persist Smart. in the post-secondary system. Um, and then finally, there's the fact that most of, many of these young people are dealing with issues at home and dealing with other issues and you want to help make sure that they've overcome them and that they've gotten the help they need so that they're at the end of 12 months. It's probably not perfect, but it seems to be a good runway to make sure they're ready to lift off and fly on their own. 100%. What about at risk or high risk? Can you define that for us just a little bit? And you sure. don't have to profile a particular student, but give us examples yeah. of a high risk youth and yeah. why that structure uh, is important. Why, you know, what, why the structure of having Jobs for America's graduate around them is important for them to succeed. So there's both some, um, I call them legal and regulatory requirements. For example, if you enroll under the Workforce and Innovation Opportunity Act funding, you got to demonstrate that you're economically disadvantaged. Okay, so you got to fill out the paperwork and mom and dad have got to sign something that says I'm poor and therefore you qualify. Not a good idea. We got to fix that, but not, okay. So there's some criteria because of our funders. So that's one thing to apply. But I'll tell you the way we come at it. We go to the guidance counselors. We say, who's not going to make it? 
Hmm. They know they know with precision. Exactly. Joe's gonna make it and Elliot is not gonna make it. Oh, and, then you. You, and then you and then you probe and you say, well, why is that? Well, the problems at home, they haven't shown up at school, they're so far behind in their education, they're absent, you know. So we look for that population the schools tell us are not gonna make it. Yes, we look for, are they on public assistance or in the single family uh, head of household who's working all the time? Are there issues that we can identify uh, in the home that are you know, contributing to, you know, up to and including somebody has got to watch the kids while mom goes to work? Well, you know, these are all issues that you've got to figure out how to resolve them, which is another important part of what we do. We've got to figure out how do you resolve those issues that get in the way of graduation or being successful at work? And that's what our frontline people are trained to do. Have you and been the, spying on my house, Ken? I have, actually. You've been using iPen ah! too, so just the other day. <laughs> so, yes. The, um, I'll say this as well, that in many ways, if, if you talk to a bunch of the students in our organization, they'll refer to JAG as their family. We didn't say that, we didn't propose that, but it is overwhelmingly how students view their time being in the chapter, working with what we call our job specialist in a class period a day to learn those competencies. There's a sense of belonging when you've read all the data that students do not feel like they belong. And in JAG, they feel a sense of belonging. I don't know how to measure that, but I am absolutely certain that it is the primary reason why it's so successful because they feel safe, they feel valued, they feel like they're part of something, they feel like there's hope and there's opportunity, which goes to the challenges of that student disengagement and the mental health issues that we talked about earlier. Wonderful. One more quick one, Nellie, and I'll pass it to you. I, you talked about mental health a lot, even within you profiling what at risk means, there's a lot of mental health concerns in there. <clears throat> and we know COVID exasperated the mental health crisis as it exists now, uh, and so on. You've been in this business for a long time, and you've seen a lot of students, a lot of issues. Do you think that there is more communication around mental health and that it existed before in the same way but wasn't discussed as much or maybe not accepted to the same level? Or do you genuinely think there are just new and evolved mental health crisis problems? Yes and yes. Mm. Um, people did not pay as much of attention as they should have. Mm -hmm. um, today, even though there's a lot more attention to it, if you look at the national media, if you look at the national discourse, people are not talking about what I at least believe to be the deepest, broadest, and maybe most intractable set of problems we've ever seen. Uh, in the schools and among young people at a scale we've never seen. Yes, there's some responses. Governments are beginning to put some resources in it, into it, but I think we're woefully inadequate in, in bringing both the right skilled professionals to it. We have many of our own staff in the front line say, I don't know how to respond to this issue. I, I worry about giving the wrong response. I, I worry so we do a lot of trauma-informed training so that they get a better sense of where some of these issues may have arisen, what it does to prompt young people to act the way they do. We're doing our best to try to help there, but the short answer, Joe, is yes and yes. Mm. Well, I will say before you jump in, Elliot, that you did indicate, Ken, that I wouldn't make it and Elliot would. I find it hard to believe. <laughs> but we'll save that conversation for another All right, day. Sorry to pick on you. Well, if it means anything, the head of my English department in high school said I would never be a writer. Uh, <laughs> and I've been a 30 year professional writer at the very high level. So sometimes the motivation is to prove someone wrong, right? To live a good life. Exactly. Uh, it, it, extending on your conversation, you know, what I find curious is, and we just wrote a story about this on Fierce Education, is giving students a sense of belonging. Uh, yes. and, you, and you said one of the most important things that you see in the underserved uh students that you work with is they don't have that sense of belonging but can you also make the argument that many students regardless of where they're coming from 
are struggling with their identity of sense of belonging in these days? And how much would you relate that to social media and what they see on social media or experience because they're living through other people's lifestyles and this virtual type of, of, of reality that they're always engaged with? Because it's not just in, in the underserved community, we're seeing it across the, the age yep. population of that, of that uh, Generation Z and Millenniums that they feel you know, that they don't have a sense of belonging. What the heck is going on? Yeah, that is a wonderful question. So again, I, I'm afraid the answer is yes and yes. I mean, yeah. the, we hear this from our students. It's, I, yeah. well, truthfully, if you look at national polling data, 70% of Americans don't feel like they belong in the nation we're in. See, that's where I, Joe and I differ. He doesn't belong, but I do. So I know. Let's start the insanity. He's in, he's in the 30%. But yeah. so this your point, I think, Elliot, is that it is a broad-based sense mm. in this in this country, not only among young people, but in general, that they're not sure that they belong. And you know, when the CDC did the interviews with all the female students, that was the overwhelming answer. I a sense of not belonging, any not belonging in their family, not belonging to school, not belonging in and the, and the digital social media, there's so much benefits to it, but man, does it create a terrible environment for an awful yeah. lot of people. I, can, you know, I know you know this, we just had a suicide by a 13 year old young lady who left a note that said that she couldn't stand anymore mm -hmm. uh, what she's saying about her on digital social media. I mean, it, mm -hmm. is, and it, it is pervasive. I don't know how in the, heck we're ever going to fix it but it is a it is a, a terribly um destructive yeah. for an awful lot of young people and they take it so personally you know if you talk to seasoned politicians and people throw crap at them all the time okay i you know i asked for it i got in this job okay you know but not when you're 13 not when you're 14 15 16. and it doesn't seem to be a line of demarcation and no. having access to certain services or support and not having access to certain services support because each student is unique. That's right. That's right. And, and which is something I believe our people on the front lines are really good at because they see mm -hmm. them every day. It's important. Spot an issue early and you get on it early and yeah. you try to deal with it early because you too often too long to Joe's earlier point. We didn't before COVID spend a lot of time worrying about it in the schools and we didn't identify it when it was more fixable and in too many cases when it was too late. Mm. Right on. You know, that's <clears throat> that's th this really powerful conversation that the two of you just had around around that, um, you know, cyberbullying is a, a big issue, right? Because everybody knows Fair. You know, it used to be you could go go to the person, you know, your dad your, or your mom would teach you how to crack somebody in the nose if they were bullying you. But now yep. Yep. you might not even be able to find that person and 100 people know before you could even get to that. Uh, that, yep. that begs the question for me on how students think right now. Um, and obviously, Elliot works in a higher ed adjacent industry talking about higher ed. Uh, I work for a college or university. I write about higher ed, too. And as you said, Ken, we're seeing enrollment declines. We're seeing the, the, the skills versus degree conversation. I don't know if it's a versus or it's probably an and we need to be, uh, you know, having that conversation more than an and. How do students come into you? These are at-risk students. Do they come in going, you know what, uh, Ken and, and, and Jag, I, I'm going to college or I want you to help me get to college? Or are they saying, you know what, everybody around me isn't going to college anymore. I know I need to get a skill so I can go to work. How are they coming to you and their thoughts around college and if it's even a possibility for them? So most of them, lots of exceptions to the statement, but most come uncertain. They just don't know. They've heard pluses and minuses. They've even heard pluses and minuses of why heck would you go to work? You know, is mm. there? So help me understand what why that. Why would I do that? The schools, remember, have signed off that this is the population most in need 
of this kind of help. Usually there's a lot more that would benefit from it, but they'll say this is the 45, 50, or 60 uh, in this school for this, this program. So we do get, and therefore to some degree, we get a clean slate to start from. They don't know, they haven't made up their mind. They, I will tell you that particularly the poorest and most disadvantaged should come from households who nobody's gone to college. Right. They do think that's for somebody else. That's for the that's for the highfalutin folks. That's for the wealthy people. That's not for me. Nailed so we it. spent a fair amount of time trying to make the case not true. It really is, and there's a ways to get there, and there's money to get you there, and there's a process to get you there. Uh, so you really can do it. I'll use the term because it's so true. These are kids that are filled with promise, and we've proven if you can unlock that promise, they will do great. You know, 84% of the kids in this country, and honestly, I don't think that's a true number, uh, supposedly graduate from high school. It's 96% if you're in Jack. If Amazing. you're an average, if an average kid in America, you know, it's 11% unemployment uh, in last May. Not if you were in Jack. It was six and a half, 40% lower. Nice. And we and we doubled the rate this population went on to post-secondary education. So the beauty of this is, and we've talked about a lot of the issues that are negatives, but the positive is give them an opportunity, give them a helping hand, show them the way and stick with them. They'll succeed. Yes. Elliot, do you have any final questions for our amazing guest today before I close them out? Yeah, I can only reiterate what he has said based on not only what we cover at Fierce Education, but I also bring my life lessons into it. And I have three children. My, my oldest has two master's degrees. Uh, my, my second one is going to college for architecture. And my third one, who is about to enter college, he wants to be a welder or an electrician. Mm. Uh, but all three raise the same. All three have different objectives of where they see opportunity. Uh, so, so the key to that is to support them in what they're looking to do is their passion. Ken, um, what, one question that I think I just thought of that begs asking for you, what jobs are on the horizon? What, what are organizations saying is coming? Because sometimes, you know, we've heard it here, you know, um, people say, well, the job that we're teaching students to do isn't even created yet. It's going to be 10 years from now, but we still have the right now and companies are dying for talent. There is a true battle for talent. What jobs are just so critical or on the horizon to be critical in your opinion? Well, probably the safest single place if you want to assure a very long and good career is healthcare. I mean, there's nothing, there's no projection that doesn't show the demand to go, going to be continuing to go up, that the uh, opportunities in healthcare writ large, not just doctors and nurses and CNAs, but technology and supply chains and, and, and all of the support systems that go into healthcare. You know, everybody knows this and everybody, you know, if there's one thing most young people think is that somewhere in technology is an opportunity. Now, I may not want to do it, but they think there's probably a lot of jobs in there. And they're absolutely right. There are. But too often they think that means a scientist or a technician or an engineer, not the full range of jobs. And so, again, part of our mission is to help them with that. But we also make the point that in fact, 10 years from now, half the jobs that exist today will not exist in 10 years. So you better be ready to learn and you better be ready to stay current and you better be flexible and adaptable because the only thing we can absolutely predict with certainty is it's gonna change. Oh yeah. Absolutely. Like that, like that. And it, it, you know, there are, I know a lot of kids as I, as I talk to kids and high risk backgrounds and I've had talks with different organizations. A lot of them want to be social media influencers. Don't even understand what the heck, when we say, you know, what kind of skill you're going to get? Oh, I'm going to learn how to right. get Instagram followers. And I go, you're not going to be making any money. You right. Know? Right. Um, that whole industry. And, but so many, I'm going to tick, I'm going to do TikTok videos and I'm going to be an influencer. Right? That is a real thought in people's head. Is yes, that it it's is. A new celebrity. It um, is. Something yep. we have to dismantle, I think. Um, boy, is that that's something to overcome. We'll save that one for another day. Can we like to ask our guests the same two questions to close out every episode? 
what did we not say about, or what did you not say about Jobs for America's graduates? Anything you want to say, take two, three minutes, anything you want to say, talk about anything you want, the mic is yours. And then we'd like you to tell us what you see for the future of higher education and learning. So I, we, the, probably the three things I'll try to, because we've spent so much time on the problems in the country and the challenges in young people is that almost all of them want to be like us. They want a good job. They want a sense of purpose. They want to actually want to show up for work on time because they want to go to work. That's what they want to do. The lack of purpose, this sense of not belonging. So I think we've got a ready and willing youth population. But to your point, Joe, I think we need to reach them where they're at and find the right ways to entice them into a process that helps them define for themselves what it is are the opportunities and give them enough knowledge about what's out there so they can make an informed decision. So I think there's an enormous amount of hope that the population that we've talked about is really anxious and wants to really you know, contribute, they wanna help. The second is how bipartisan JAG is. We have 10 governors that serve on the national board. That's the largest number of governors to serve on any single board of the country. And they're from right to left. And I don't, I've made it a practice not to ask them to agree on anything else except support for Jobs for America's graduates. And they're enthusiastic. They share their reputations, which in this era is no minor matter. They share their time and their commitment. So the fact is we were, you know, were founded by uh, Republican and Democratic governors, by then Vice President Mondale, who was succeeded by then Vice President George Bush, Republicans and Democrats. So this is a rare bipartisan set of support across state legislatures and school boards and, and others. And finally, I guess I'll make the case that with, with all these issues we've described and all the needs of employers, it's a moment of opportunity, actually, to take all of this massive federal and state funding and put it to work with things that work. Obviously, I'll always make the case to put it in a jag, but there are a lot of things that are working. We need to get them to scale. Hmm. Good thoughts. I, I was just looking at, and I didn't look at your board of directors. By the way, let me just, you've got the, oh gosh, you've got the governor of, like every uh, Iowa, let's see who else we got on here. We've got the yep. U.S. senator from Tennessee, the governor of Maine, U.S. senator from Delaware, governor of Iowa. I said that governor of Kansas, the U.S. senator from North Dakota, governor of Montana. Uh, I mean Indiana, go governor right. of South Carolina, governor of Missouri. The the point is is that this looks like, it is one of the most important single issues that we can talk about and discuss, and that's how we get uh, in complete uh, training for our workforce, our future, our fu the people who are gonna be running this country and, and making, uh, making us economically uh, uh, prosperous. And I really applaud the work you're doing, Ken, and, and Jobs for America's graduates. It's obviously very important work that you've dedicated your whole life to. And uh, wow, what an organization, congratulations. Al, thank you so much for the opportunity to talk about. Well, let me outro my guest co-host here, Elliot Malkowitz. <laughs> Elliot from Fierce Education. He's the editor-in-chief. Elliot, thanks for uh, coming back. Thank you. It's always a pleasure, Joe, to speak with you and your guests. Uh, this was pro one of my favorite conversations ever, just because I think the impact of this is so important. So important. Ladies and gentlemen, my guest, your guest today, here he is. He's Ken Smith. He is president and CEO of Jobs for America's Graduates. And he is an amazing man with an amazing company and I bet amazing employees that work for him to help all these kids. Ken, thanks for being here. We hope you had a good time. I did. I enjoyed it and I appreciate it. Ladies and gentlemen, you've just ed upped. It's time to level up. The beginning of a new era in higher education begins with you. Order your copy of Commencement. The Beginning of a New Era in Higher Education by Kate Colbert, Dr. Joseph Lucille, with contributions by Elvin Freitas. It's Higher Education's must-read book of 2022. Discover how you can seize the moment to change higher education 
forever. Commencement, the beginning of a new era in higher education now available on Amazon. For bulk orders, contact Kate, Joe, or Elvin 